one of the funny things um, that we sometimes see with, oh, if institutions come in, does it go into ETH, does it work three, or even more centralization? Like, even when Bitcoin ETF started coming out, some people were concerned about it, but most people basically were like, hey, we've got BlackRock and those guys, and then ballot into space, and actually it's, it's a good thing, right? Uh, and of course, Bitcoin ETFs are kind of the first wave of things, but actually we've seen already with other tokens that institutions uh, starting family offices are like, hey, you know what, what are these other tokens? What do we know about them? And when I talk about institutional grade, it means that it has to be the kind of project that is able to appeal to an institution because the benefit of the institution is that they have holding power. They can look at long-term horizons. They have a thesis and they can invest on a thesis and back that. Whereas if you go for you know, a, a consumer market, right, outside of the utility, many of them will basically speculate. And I think this is the other challenge. Where three or four years ago, your portfolio might be five or 10, maybe 20 tokens. You can spend time understanding it. Now, what the intention was having with meme coins, you have hundreds of tokens in your portfolio. Your attention to actually research and understand it isn't there. Institutions won't touch meme coins. Right? They're not going to go in those areas, but they want to go for things that are more fundamental or they believe in and they have something that they can sort of back. So this is why Tom, or even Solana, now, of course, Ethereum, uh, and, and you know, Mokaverse and those ones actually have done much better because an institution can understand that and say, hey, you know what, I get the thesis, I can back that, and I can have that for the long term. And it also creates some kind of stability in the market. The US equity market is 80% institutional. So I understand you know, why some people are critical of this. But actually, in Web3, it's totally the opposite. So, I mean, outside of expanding, you know, what we're doing in gaming, obviously one big narrative that we're really fortunate to see was what's happening with Tom and Telegram. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's actually driving a lot of mass adoption. Gaming, one of ours uh, in, in, in the group company, has now almost 100 million users because of Telegram. Mm -hmm. And, you know, daily active users are in millions, which is good even for web standards. Uh, and so, you know, we've invested heavily in basically the target ecosystem as a narrative for growth, certainly until, until it's sort of short to midterm. Uh, the other thing that we're very heavily focused on is uh, digital identity. We think that solves uh, the problem of, you know, what we need is reputation. So, you know, when you think about things like airdrops and so on, actually, a lot of reasons why I think the market has suffered is because it's been farmed by bots and all that stuff, right? So, it's not just proving that you're human, like a KYC wallet and sell that wallet, it's not good enough. You need to basically have almost like an online degree and a certification of your symbolic capital to say, hey, you know what? I've been a good actor, you know, maybe I don't dump your tokens, you know, or I've been playing the game, I've created the value. And as a result, as you build your basically digital reputation on chain in a zero knowledge way, actually people will come to you. And I can imagine basically people sort of giving you better benefits because they say, you know what, you're a good actor, or you're someone who helps build those networks, or you're an investor of a certain great, and I'm going to give you more benefits as a result of that. I think we've seen that development. Mogoverse today has uh, over 1.8 million such users. And we add lots of value to the networks as well. So I think that's that's another area of focus. And the third part is uh, we're quite focused on this what we describe as the institutional era of crypto. The institutional era of crypto really was heralded at the start of Bitcoin ETFs, right? And obviously that sort of pushed that forward. But now what we're also seeing is that the type of networks that could be represented by tokens that actually have institutional backing, so you know, Solana, Ton as well, not just Ethereum and Bitcoin have actually done broadly okay in the last uh, period. But then those set of tokens that are very, very, let's call it, consumer retail driven without institutional backing have struggled much more, including ones that have listed. And it's so a list of why? Because we've had so much dilution attention. You know, uh, Pumped Up Fund is responsible for over 2 million token launches this year alone. It's right. okay. So, so you know, when you wonder why are, why are altcoins not doing as well as they did like, three, years, uh, three years ago, even though Bitcoin and Ethereum have recovered uh, much more. It's not that altcoins actually have shrunk. Actually, altcoins have grown by almost $300 million um, over, over, over a one-year period. It's actually that the dilution attention and therefore the value distribution has been much more distributed uh, as a result. So I think institutional grade type of projects, the ones that can appeal to institutions, will do better. And that's what we experienced in MoGA. MoGA had institutional backing. And so when we launched the MoGA token, you know, for as part of the supporting the Mokovers Foundation, actually, we had a lot more support that allowed it to actually be, uh, you know, a really successful token launch in summer, which is usually a really, really difficult time versus other projects, right? So, so those are some of the things that, um, you know, uh, we're really focused on. Uh, and of course, you know, education remains a big focus for open campus and what we're doing basically, uh, you know, with those. Institutions uh, actually in crypto are only single digit percentage in terms of its ownership. 
And actually, what's really interesting is that there's a long, long way to go before institutions even, even ever get close to the 8% number. And I actually think the way to create that balance is if it's more like 50 50. Right? I mean, if, uh, if more of the basic in the retail and the institutional component is more balanced, I think it creates a really fair and dynamic. The kind of markets that are very retail driven, when you look at places like Taiwan, for instance, are, as, are super choppy, kind of similar to how crypto looks like. And the kind of markets that are more stable, like the US, are heavily institutional. So I think you need a blend of both. And so what we tell our portfolios is that you need to build your institutional capability because that's how you stand out, right? You're not going to stand out if you appeal to the same user base that's moving around, but you are going to stand out if your project is something that an institution can go, which, you know, by the way, that doesn't mean suit and tie, but it does mean that you have to be able to present to them, that you have to have a plan for the project, and that, you know, essentially in some ways you could say you have a kind of maturity to your business, which is, by the way, normal, right? I mean, that's what happened with .com, that's happened with mobile gaming companies, all that type of stuff. You start up building products, and then later on, you mature as a business such that you are institutional. But I think one of the big gaps right now, uh, and we're trying to fill some of that, and I think other people are looking at this space as well, is more activity in what we call sort of, I guess, institutional liquid sort of, I guess, investing. So the traditional VC investing model in the past, really, in Web3 was seed, pre-seed, and basically participate in the stage, and then, you know, there's a TG, and, you know, over time, maybe investors can make money. That's come somewhat under fire, because obviously the participation of the investor has only, you know, especially if he's running an LP fund, we're a little bit different there, um, it necessitates that over time that they basically sell their tokens for a return, right? However, if you look at a liquid strategy, that's different, right? So it means you actually buy tokens on a regular market. I think the future of every investor in Web3 is to do both, right? And that's what we're doing as well. And I think some of the big institutions are doing both. But right now, for, you know, the traditional EC model, you know, the IPO is an exit path. And actually now, I don't think we can look at it quite the same. We can look at tokens in the market as an opportunity as well. And I think to be a successful VC in the space, you actually have to do both, right? You have to have both the liquid strategy and participate in that market and support that. And, you know, and I also think that's the value add. Like if I want to work with you as an investor, I am going to just work with you because you give us funding and then later on you own the token and, you know, you have to sell in the future because you have to provide a return. Or are you going to be the kind of investor that can also help support the market? you know, when it makes sense. And that to me basically is, I think, the multifaceted role of value that a VC can offer because it's not just about sort of, you know, giving you capital, which is really, you know, abundant in many ways. It's really about and, and connection to services and also these other elements that flow to this. Um, the other thing that, you know, we see obviously is it's really, really critical that we build strong reputation frameworks. You know, um, I think if you build strong reputation frameworks, it will solve the scam issues, it will solve the security issues, we solve many fundamental problems that we have. Uh, and I think this is, again, one of those things that you know, we want to do with Mocha ID. If you build a reputation, it's something to protect. And one thing we find also interesting is that in real life, we will actually spend our money to protect our reputation. Right? But in Web3, if I don't have a reputation to protect, then essentially the incentives are entirely economic. And that's what we see with all these airdrop farmers. They don't care if they sell, they don't care if they don't, because from their perspective, they know you can't build trust in a frame if I don't know who you are. I, I mean, knowing who you are isn't based on knowing your identity fully. It's just knowing that you're a trusted actor in the space. It's like imagining going to a conference and every single person you meet is random and new every single time, right? You can't actually build a trust framework on that. And that's what's missing, I think, in Web3. And so we're trying to solve the more kind idea. So really, uh, it's not just about us investing in our own capital, which is what we do, it's also about basically working with our funds, introducing them, and supporting our portfolio companies to basically become institutional grade and institutional grade. That's again a capability that would uh, normally be necessary. Normally, in the field of RBC, we prepare you to go public, and then you go public is a totally different investor caliber. It's a totally different team. But actually, Web3, because of the token payment, it's actually a good idea. And I think another thing I want to point out is that I think still people don't fully understand the nature of tokens. Right? You think of tokens sometimes as quasi liquid instruments, but in reality, tokens are representations of network effects. Right? If you own a token, you're a member of the network state, and you benefit from the network effects in and of itself. Right? And actually, the more decentralized the network is, the more value you receive from the network itself than necessary for the business that's offering the service that you have initiated.